explanation to what we are doing on our day-to-day -day, um, research in our lab. Uh, okay, first of all, uh, as you know, our lab is based in Nur Sultan City in Nazarbayev University, right here. Uh, we are on the other side of the university. We are in the Block C4. So for those of you, maybe if you are international students or have not had a chance to uh, visit uh, our campus yet, uh, uh, that's our facilities where they are based. And um, um, we have basically uh, our facilities inside the campus of the university. So I'll give you a little bit of history about our, our lab. Our group has been funded around 2016. Uh, with a very small uh, number of students. Uh, and uh, as of today, they become uh, one, um, a very large group, counting uh, uh, two postdocs, uh, two PhD students, uh, six researchers, uh, uh, three master students, and four undergraduate students that are all working um, in our group. Most of them are working on a permanent base inside the lab. Uh, our lab facilities is located in the block C4 of the university. Uh, on the second floor in the electronics and photonics cluster, which counts several labs that are dedicated to the areas of photonics uh, and, and electronics. Uh, and this is a cluster that is shared together with other members of the School of Engineering and the physics department, and some researchers also uh, that come from the biological background. Uh, our facilities are based in two rooms, the 208, where I'm sitting right now, this is a 45 square meter lab that is mainly dedicated to the research in optical sensors, in optical fiber sensors, and in the characterization of sensors. And we are quite well equipped to run a um, quite large series of research. And uh, the other room that is also uh, on the back of this um, room, that is uh, 243, which is a lab dedicated to optical biosensors. Um, it has most of the biological equipment uh, for functionalizations. Uh, and uh, it is also as an area that is dedicated to the research on nanomaterials, particularly on the synthesis of nanomaterials. This is a little bit of a view of our main facilities. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, fiber optic sensing, which is our main area of research, uh, we are quite well equipped. We have the uh, OBR 4600 uh, instrument of the Luna. It is an instrument that is capable of detecting uh, the data from every single point of an optical fiber cable, which is a pretty unique feature. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the most advanced splicers that basically allows us to manufacture several kinds of devices based on glass fibers using the potential of lasers and microfabrications. We have a wide range of interrogators and we even have a project uh, related to the area of thermal ablation in cancer care. Uh, for this, we have basically most of our uh, equipment that is based right here in, uh, in our labs. Or next to that, we have, of course, we have a wide range of uh, spectrometers, uh, biological characterization equipment, ovens, characterization uh, equipment for optical fibers, and so on. Uh, this is a quite well-equipped research lab. Uh, uh, and uh, I can say that uh, it certainly features the research of a group of that is 15, 20 people. So we are certainly quite in a, in a good range uh, of, in terms of research group. Uh, and here is a little bit of overview of our funding. Uh, as of today, we are running uh, three grants uh, uh, based on research, uh, two in which we are leading the research right here, uh, and one that is the first ever research grant funded by NATO in Kazakhstan that involves a collaboration with the School of Medicine and two international partners in Italy and in Albania. And we also have a, a Erasmus Plus projects that are totally dedicated to the students uh, with two universities, one in Spain, Polytechnic University of Valencia, and one in Italy, that is Biomedical Campus of Rome. Now, I'll give you a little bit of introduction about our research. Uh, most of what we do uh, is uh, uh, dedicated to the research in optical fiber sensors. Certainly, most of you are familiar with sensors as of measurement device in our everyday life, even just turning on your phone and you have several sensors that measure um, temperature, electric discharge, uh, um, uh, impedance, uh, magnetic fields, and so on, that are all based in, a, in, a, in, in our phone. So what is the idea of using instead optical fiber cables as a sensing instrument? The, um, the optical fiber has been designed for telecommunication. In fact, uh, most of you are familiar with the fiber as a, a way to bring high-speed internet uh, to the home or to the building. Uh, the idea of using optical fiber is that the sensors are much more miniature and therefore has a much more a smaller footprint than um, the sensors which most of us are used to. 
So the idea is that we can miniaturize the sensor up to the um, micrometer scale. And not only we can mani manipulate the sensor in such a way, but we can also inscribe several sensors along the same fiber. And this approach has become particularly important nowadays. Um, the fibers are biocompatible. They can work even in the body. They are immune to electromagnetic interference, so such as radiation, for example. Uh, they allow even a remote sensing and uh, they detect in a very narrow location. What we are doing in our lab is uh, basically the application of this sensing concept to a technique called distributed sensing. So we take uh, an optical fiber and we measure every single location of the fiber, measuring the tiny reflection event that occur. In this sense, uh, the fiber itself becomes an entire sensor. So rather than uh, uh, detecting, as most of you are familiar with, in a specific point, we are detecting uh, with a very tiny resolution, we're talking about millimeters of resolution, over a very long region. So we can detect, for example, strain, temperature, pressure, uh, not in a single point, but in every millimeter of the fiber. This technique uh, uh, in our lab is employed in specific biomedical applications. That's what we are mainly mastering in our lab. So what we are trying to do is to apply this concept um, that comes from the sensing technology and, base, and build uh, biomedical sensors that <clears throat> incorporate this type of uh, sensing methods. This is uh, one of the areas of research that uh, we are working on with uh, several researchers. Uh, and what we are doing basically is that we are trying to design a medical needle, the one on the left, um, that is, uh, connecting several fibers along its length is capable of reconstructing the shape of the needle in real time. So that when we insert the needle, this is a, an epidural anesthesia needle. In real time, we reconstruct the shape of the needle and we can tell if uh, the clinician has reached the epidural space or not. And uh, if we are missing the insertion or not. So here we have reconstructed in our lab using phantoms. This uh, is a well calibrated layers of meat that basically reconstruct the anatomical model of uh, the epidural insertion. And uh, this needle that incorporates several optical fiber uh, will be able to reconstruct uh, the shape of it in real time. I will show you more or less how it works. This is uh, uh, one of our sensing feature that we detect. As you can see on the, uh, on the upper part of the screen, uh, as the time progresses, we can detect uh, the strain, so the extension or compression of the needle in several points along the fiber. So not just in one location, but in several points. So we don't have uh, the, uh, the possibility, I mean, we, we are past the possibility of measuring parameters in time. We are measuring our data in time and space. So this is more or less how it works. And uh, in time and space, we can reconstruct uh, needles that take a correct path, misalignments, and so on. So this is basically based on a single fiber. And this is when we incorporate multiple fibers. So the idea is that we can go from one fiber to many fibers. Uh, and if we go up to four in a setup that is more, very complex, uh, what we can do is basically reconstructing the whole shape of the needle. I will now show you how it works in real time with some videos. So the video upstairs are not in scale. The video downstairs is really the scale of the needle. And you can see that in real time, without the use of radiation, without the use of imaging, uh, inside the tissue, so with, with no line of sight, we are able to reconstruct uh, the shape of the needle, detecting whether there are correct insertions or wrong insertions. This is one of the areas in which we are heavily working right now at the moment. And uh, we have uh, um, two researchers that have built a model um, that takes a lot, this plenty of data and is able now to uh, reconstruct the shape of the needle. We call this technology shape sensing in three dimensions. And the next step uh, involves the work with the uh, machine learning methods that uh, will be able uh, to, uh, to classify the events that happen in this uh, uh, in these trajectories. I don't know why something appears on the screen. Okay, let's move on. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so, 
Another area in which we are heavily working, which is the second area in our, of, of, of main research in our lab, is uh, uh, the technologies that allow uh, using, uh, again, a miniature medical device uh, to remove cancer. Um, we call this type of approach thermal ablation because it's rooted on the fact that we use electromagnetic waves coming from a radio frequency generator or a microwave generator or a laser generator that heat in the surrounding of a tissue, which corresponds to a tumor, a solid tumor. In general, this application is performed on solid tumor and using the high temperature is able to kill the cells in a specific location. For this to happen, we need to have a sensing network that is able to detect the temperature at that specific location. So once again, we have built a network of sensors using specific fibers uh, that are quite specific for this, uh, for this type of application. And once again, we use our capability of uh, um, putting a lot of sensor in a very small space, much more than other technologies, and resolve uh, the, the temperature distribution that we measure in the tissue. So this is again what, as we see our data. We have four fibers and for each fiber we are able to generate what we call a thermal map that reports the temperature in space and time. And combining again a lot of data, so as you can see this research actually, although it's a biomedical engineering research, it basically has a strong rooting on uh, uh, data science because we are actually reconstructing plenty of data and recombining plenty of data and using uh, signal processing methods. And we are able to reconstruct the temperature shape in three dimension. This is sensing data, this is not imaging. So, and, and as you can see, the results are actually very close to imaging. So here again, I show you what happens when you turn on our generator in a meat phantom that uh, mimics the behavior in human liver. So I think the video has begun, yes. Uh, so you can see from the video, you will see right now that as the time progresses in a rapid evolution, we can reach temperatures that are up to 100 degrees. And the 60 degree threshold, which is this uh, uh, light Chan color, represents the uh, area that we have been able to bring to mortality. So in this case, uh, we have been able to ablate an area that is about one centimeter, uh, which corresponds uh, in medical application to a small tumor that we have been able to treat uh, without using surgical um, resection or without using other invasive methods. Uh, yes, we have been able to bring this technology more recently even to lasers and uh, we have been able to use a, a laser in this case to ablate a similar phantom. The picture as you see right below are a setup that we just assembled in our lab uh, using the meat phantoms a solid state laser, uh, a precise in delivery system, uh, and, uh, our, uh, um, and our network of optical fiber sensors. So once again, stacking a very um, large amount of data in a tiny space. And uh, later, uh, in, we have been able to perform ablation in which we introduce also nanomaterial inside the tissue to change the electrical and optical properties of the tissue. Here is our space-time data. So once again, space-time data that we have been able to design for different type of nanoparticles and different type of laser source. Uh, on the left, we show the whole temperature. On the right, with our estimation of the treated uh, regions. So a very nice uh, uh, resolution. Um, and with some recent uh, uh, achievements, we have been able to move from a 2D temperature data to a three-dimensional temperature data. This has been a first ever in, uh, to the best of our knowledge because using several fibers in a specific arrangement that we develop in our lab, uh, we have been able to measure temperature uh, with space-time data for so many fibers that at the end we could be able to perform a 3D reconstruction. This is more or less how it works. Uh, the data that have been acquired on the left have been recombined to the right to create space-time temperature maps. And here is how it shows in a video. So this has been a, this is a preview of one of our re most recent results. And you will see that when the chart is done on scale, 
that when the heat starts to appear, we have been able to reconstruct in three dimension the temperature of our uh, of the tissue at several parts during heating and during cooling. So we are using now this technology uh, for sensing in uh, at such micro scale, uh, where we have basically resolving um, almost like imaging, but without the use of images. So performing also measurements that are inside the phantom, so not just external. The other, the last area in our lab is related to biosensing. So we turn our fibers using a very similar principle into sensors that can measure uh, biological parameters. Uh, in this case, for example, we have been targeting the detection of protein biomarkers. In this work, we presented our sensing network to detect thrombin, which is a, a, a biomarker of cardiovascular diseases. Uh, the way we do is that we uh, perform a manipulation of the fiber. In this case, we chemically etch the fiber using uh, um, hydrofluoric acid. And uh, we perform a surface functionalization using uh, thin metallic films uh, that are sputtered on the fiber. And uh, that allows us to immobilize several bioreceptors on the fiber surface. So rather than measuring now physical parameters, we now are able to capture on our fiber the changes of biological parameters. In this case, you can see from the picture that uh, increasing the concentration of uh, the analyte thrombin, we have been able to collect more of it on the surface of the fiber. And our sensor is capable of measuring the surrounding environment. This type of sensing that we have uh, reported recently and that is just based on optical fiber with no assisting devices uh, has been labeled as reflectorless biosensing. And we have been the first group uh, to achieve these results and we reported that uh, at the beginning of 2020. So this has been a very important milestone for us. The other device that we are developing in our lab is called Ball Resonator. And here is a view of it, um, where we use our splicer to create a sort of ball lens on the fiber uh, terminating the fiber with this sort of uh, spherical shape that when the light is introduced to it, it behaves as a sort of uh, uh, reflective device. This is a very rapid fabrication. It takes about 30 seconds to manufacture one, as opposite to many of the other competing sensors that takes uh, several hours uh, to fabricate. So this is uh, potentially a very low cost and uh, high volume uh, biosensor. Uh, with a small scale, we're talking about uh, half of a millimeter in terms of um, diameter of our spherical resonator. And when we expose that to different uh, changes of protein, we measure the optical spectra and we measure the differences in the optical spectra. Using uh, uh, that method, we have been able to achieve pretty good results in terms of we are sensing at the picomolar uh, concentration range, whereas most of the technology in general senses at the nanomolar range. This is the process of fabrication uh, of a biosensor. So what we normally do is that after we fabricate the device, uh, we clean the surface of the fiber. Uh, we use uh, a treatment based on aptus, which is a sort of biological glue. Um, we perform a um, over uh, treatment of glutaldehyde, uh, which allows a better uh, surface blocking. Uh, we mobilize the bioreceptors, in this case aptamers, on the surface of the fiber uh, using a, a blocking method to block the aptamer on the surface so that they don't disappear when we perform the uh, measurement. And then we incubate our analyte for a short time until we are able, able to achieve a certain detection. And, and this is another type of device and basically is how it, it shows. We measure spectra in real time. And we can measure actually the concentration in, re in, re in real time. So this type of sensing in the future will replace a biopsy uh, because we have been able to get a response in real time. So we are measuring concentration in really in real time and with the same device that we use uh, for sensing physical parameters. So in conclusion, I just point you out the many collaborations that our group has. Uh, as we said, we have several projects. We're also collaborating with several international institutions. Many of them are based in Italy, where we have collaborators for medical projects, as well as for shape sensing and thermal ablation. We have a collaboration with Nice um, in France uh, for the manufacturing of the specific fiber that we use in our projects. 
uh, we have projects together with the University of uh, Polytechnic University of Valencia in Spain, um, and we also have several other collaborators in China, Jinan University, in Portugal, uh, Institute, Institute of Telecommunication in Aveiro, in uh, Belgium, in Mons University, and in the US, in Johns Hopkins University, with whom we build the shape sensing model. We also have some national collaboration, particularly with Asfand Yarov University in Almaty, and with two institutes now in uh, Nur Sultan, particularly uh, with the National Scientific Research Center, uh, with whom we have worked uh, plenty for a thermal ablation project, and we have performed measurements in their clinic, as well as in the biotech center, and also close to our border with Novosibirsk State University, which has a very nice facility for the fabrication of uh, optical fiber devices. So that's a little bit of a view of our lab. Uh, of course, please feel free to ask me any question. If you want to ask any question at any time, please feel free to email me. Now, the real lab visits, so whether you will be able to see uh, our labs, I'm always available for that, of course, pending the COVID-19 regulation, please keep up with that. Uh, and uh, if you want to inquire for open positions for researchers, research assistants and so on, uh, we are open for that, of course. Uh, our budget will be starting mainly from the middle of 2021, where we hope uh, that our lab can physically reopen, uh, not only for researchers, but also for the students, because that would be very important for us, uh, considering the several restrictions that we have. And that's all. So thanks all for the attention. Please uh, ask any question and feel free to go on with uh, anything you would like to ask about our research more in detail. And don't be shy. Anyone? Please guys, feel free to unmute the microphone and directly ask your questions and uh, your direct inquiries. Guys, you can also use the chat if you're too shy to speak on microphones. Okay, uh, I see a finally questions. Uh, could you please tell about the available position for the next year? Yes, um, so as you know, we have several uh, grants available right now, and uh, uh, we, uh, we are looking for several kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, skills. Uh, at first of all, uh, um, we would not mind to recruit a person with the skills in engineering uh, that also has competence in machine learning because we have a couple of projects on which we would like to merge our uh, sensing technology with the methods that are based more on, uh, on machine learning. Um, we have uh, openings also for uh, persons with uh, um, data analysis um, knowledge, like uh, MATLABs and so on. Uh, <clears throat> as well as uh, uh, we are looking for every other type of, uh, of, uh, of skills. So it's not about, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, um, students, I see that the next, there is a next student uh, for related for senior students and graduates only. No, in general, no. Uh, I would be happy to work with every level of students. We have several undergraduate students, including uh, a second year student in biology, for example. So it's not that uh, um, the, the background that is the problem. Uh, it's much more the idea of somebody who is happy to spend the time in the lab uh, and, um, and uh, get involved in our lab research. Our research is mainly experimental, so really we need to have the, you know, 
the lab is, is our working place. So our lab is quite well equipped, um, but of course need a little bit of training to get uh, to get to the full, uh, I mean, to, to be able to exploit the whole, uh, the whole research. Actually, most of our students began as undergraduate students where they had no idea about optical fibers at all. Uh, and so, and they became quite established researchers over time. So in this case, uh, um, it's not a, the, the background is not a problem. So uh, for students, uh, please uh, feel free to email me uh, if there is an area that you feel you have uh, more interest or, you know, we can have a conversation in any case uh, uh, and I can send you a little bit of material to read uh, so that you get uh, much more the feeling about what we are doing. If you said you would like to work as a research assistant, so that means that you will be recruited on a project uh, and work on this specific project. Um, I say that probably the earlier date where we can begin working uh, is probably around May next year. Uh, and that's mainly as to be, to, to be due to the fact that right now we cannot recruit anybody. <laughs> uh, so the, for 2020, certainly not. And for 2021, there are of course budget uh, restrictions and so on. But uh, in any case, we are planning to really recruit uh, also um, research assistants from the next year. Remember that by the rule of the university, undergraduate students up to the second year can work in our lab, but we cannot recruit anybody as a research assistant. Uh, we can recruit uh, people of third and fourth year um, uh, undergraduate students as uh, research assistants for a part-time work. Uh, and uh, we can also recruit the master students uh, uh, for a thesis. If you, are very, if you are interested in a thesis uh, in our group, of course, uh, we are open for that. I would be very happy to to have uh, you know, students to work on a thesis. And uh, in that case, uh, also, there might be the possibility to, to work for about one year as a research assistant. I hope this answered your question. OK, does anyone have yes, other questions? Yes, Thank you. Does anybody have more questions? Either in the chat or uh, by voice? We can wait maybe one minute to see if somebody has a there's more question, but please don't be shy and feel free to ask directly the question also so we can, we can talk the, directly. Uh, okay, there is a, will you publish available position on research and you dot edu? Uh, a good question, but because we are trying right now to refresh our website and create a website for our group. So uh, in this case, uh, I never published the advertised location there, but it's better to talk with me directly by email. Also because, uh, you know, the research projects are very fluid. So uh, these are the main areas in which we are working. But uh, if uh, you feel like you have a project that you would like to accomplish in our lab, uh, also I am able to, um, I mean, not every project is born by uh, our research. Some projects are born by students that would like to work in one area and uh, we are interested in that. So we try to make the research available for that. Uh, I can send more information about the projects, yes, uh, in some written version. In this case, uh, please send me an email and uh, I will be happy uh, to send uh, uh, more data about that. Yes, uh, for sure. And uh, I just would like to reinstate, um, although we sometimes we are looking for people with a specific background, uh, like any research group is doing, uh, uh, in general, we like the idea of working with students. So we try to make our lab is available for students. Now, the, the main problem right now is the restrictions uh, that we have for our research. Um, uh, because uh, as you know, at the moment, we cannot have more than two, three people in every lab room. 
And considering that several projects, particularly the biological one, requires measurements that last several days. Um, so uh, it is possible that the instrument is booked uh, for uh, one week or two weeks in a row. Um, now, I hope that next year this problem will be solved and uh, even undergraduate students will be able to work, uh, to work uh, uh, in, the, in the lab, uh, but I don't have any more information about that. So again, this is one thing that we can also discuss by email. Does anybody have more questions? Okay, guess so there are no more questions. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this presentation. Uh, I hope that it was really interesting for our participants today, for our watchers. Uh, we, of course, will uh, publish the recording of today's session. Uh, we will send the link for all the one who is participating today. And we will also attach uh, Professor Daniel's email. Yep, students can, yep. students can write to you about the positions, about the research, anything that they're interested, right? Yes, sure. And I would like to thank you, Ibin, for the organization and uh, everybody for the, uh, for the attendance and for the questions. It was very interesting. Uh, thank you, Professor, for uh, making this event possible for us. Yeah, this was our uh, second remote lab tour of the weekly tours. Yeah, next week we will also have uh, more remote lab tours. Please uh, check our Instagram, so we will publish all the necessary information there. You can find the next participants, next speakers there. And thank you all for coming today. Uh, stay safe, stay home, and uh, hope you'll do everything right. Good. Thank you. Goodbye to all. Thank you, Professor. Goodbye. Goodbye.